Now, I believe that the daemon will guide you and that it will guide you by maybe sometimes giving you deja vu sensations. And I think a deja vu sensation is literally you accidentally, as an Edelon who lives the life once, can access the the thoughts and the, the memories of the daemon of your many lives. And indeed, just as a very quick analogy here as well, you're aware of the movie Groundhog Day. Okay. Now, interesting aside here is the guy that wrote Groundhog Day, the, the original writer of Groundhog Day, was a guy called Danny Rubin. And when my first book came out, Danny bought copies of my book to all his friends because he said, this guy's done the science of Groundhog Day. And indeed, the a Russian language edition of Groundhog Day, of, of my book, my first book, Is There Life After Death, the, in Russian was entitled uh, Groundhog Life. <laughs> and remembering Groundhog Day, what happens to the central character, Phil Connors? Do you remember he goes down to see Punk's Attorney Phil, you know, during the, ground, uh, the Groundhog Day? Right. And he right. gets, gets up the next morning and he hears Sonny and Cher playing on the radio, which he heard the previous morning. And he thinks that the show's just being repeated. But he goes downstairs and he finds he's living the same day again. And then he gets up the next day and it happens again. And he suddenly realises that he's trapped in this temporal loop where he's living the same day over and over again. But what is important when people turn around and say it's Groundhog Day all over and again? Remember, for Phil Connors, the central character, every day is different. He doesn't live the same day. He lives... Everybody else lives the same day, but his actions change their actions. And what he does is, over many, many days, and I discussed this with Danny Rubin himself, as to why he came up with the idea and everything else, which is an interesting aside which we could touch upon. But effectively what it means is, do you remember what he does? He initially gets terribly depressed and tries to commit suicide. And he commits suicide dozens of times in various ways. And he still wakes up the next morning hearing Sonny and Cher. And then he realises that he has power here because there's the girl he wants to bed. So he decides, every time I go out with a date with her, I get more information about her, which tells me next time, the next day, I can impress her because I'll know all the books she loves. I'll turn around and say, do you know, my favourite author is so-and-so. And she'll go, wow, you're so like me. God, this is incredible. We've got so much in common. But what he's doing, he's doing it for selfish reasons, isn't he? He's doing it because he wants to bed the girl. And then he moves on to the next stage where he decides he can learn things. So he, te- he goes and starts piano lessons and he becomes a great pianist. And then he starts learning the violin. And Danny told me, he calculated in his original script, that about 6,000 lives, 6,000 days that Connor would have, Connors would have gone through. But then you remember what he does? He then starts to do good for doing good's sake. And he's running around the town. He's making sure that the little kid that falls out the tree doesn't break his leg and everything else. And he tries to save the old tramp, which he fails to do. But nevertheless, he's doing good for doing good's sake. And suddenly you can see what actually is going on is he's evolving. Through living that day over and over again, he's becoming a more rounded human being. Mm. Now, I argue that really what is happening in that movie is that it's like the Edelon, which was the original Connors, has been lost and the daemon has become the major consciousness and the daemon is the one that's driving him. And you remember he lives the perfect day and then he moves on. And I think that's what happens with our lives. I think that we are here to progress and it's very much the basis of Vedanta and, and very many Eastern religions that argues this is what we do. And I argue this is, this makes sense. But the difference is that whereas in that movie, I do the science of this. I apply something called the many minds hypothesis of quantum mechanics. I apply the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which whoever at the third wrote in his PhD thesis in 1957. And all of these are supported by quantum mechanics. And indeed, there's a new movie out that I'm in contact with the director, which is called Quantum Suicide. And check this out because it's extraordinary, because effectively it's taking a thought experiment that um, a a Swedish-American 
a cosmologist called Max Tegmark came up with in the late 1990s. And it's an application of, of the, the phenomenon known as Schrodinger's cat. And without going into great detail, effectively, quantum mechanics suggests that we collapse the wave function of our lives, our reality, by observing things, by making subatomic particles change from being a wave, a statistical wave, to being a point particle located in a particular position in space and time. And by doing that, we collapse by our actions, the universe around us. And we are surrounded by other people that are doing the same. So we are collectively creating our own universe, but we are sharing that universe with others. And as we move through our lives, we make choices, like I was saying before, you know, the way how Connors makes choices. And we make choices. And going back to my incident on the motorway, I died last time. But this time round, my daemon was able to guide me, to save me. So there was a whole new life that I'd never had before that I started living. And how I progressed this, and this is how I wrote the book, and this is where the ideas came from. So you get the idea that the universe is far more interesting. Now, people will say to me and say, yeah, well, you know, you've done some of the science, but, you know, it doesn't make logical sense because how can you just live your life again how can you how well, who are other people within this scenario and i argue in in cheating the ferryman and even more so in my latest book i argue that and you know at the end of the book i introduce two new two new concepts i say that above the daemon is something i call the uber daemon which is the collective unconscious of the all of humanity it's effectively an entity a sentience that knows everything that human beings can know and can know all of the people's previous lives. And when people have hypnotic regression into past lives and when people have past life memories, I argue that what's happening is their memories, they're drawing the memories not from the daemon, which is memories of your own life, but the memories of the uber daemon which is basically the collective unconscious of humanity. So therefore, that's how somebody, when they're hypnotically regressed, will suddenly regress to being a, a 17th century French peasant. My third book was called The Labyrinth of Time. And in The Labyrinth of Time, I expound upon the concept of time cycles and the circularity of time and indeed the mystery of time, both psychologically and need to do with the physics of it and everything else as well. Because rather like St. Augustine, who, when he wrote about time, said that when he doesn't think about it properly, he understands exactly what time is. But the minute you start to think about it, it becomes incredibly mysterious, which it is. But on top of that, it's how time flows. Do is it flow around us? Do we go through it? And in this particular Area. I mean, I'm particularly interested in the writings of a guy called um, John William Dunn, who in 1927 wrote a book called An Experiment with Time, because he'd had a series of events that took place way back initially in 1903 when he was down in South Africa, when he had a number of incredibly precognitive dreams. And he came to the conclusion that when we dream, we dream the future. And his argument was very, very elaborate but very, very clever and not dissimilar to my own in many, many ways, in the sense that what he argued, and you will see the resonance here with the Daemon and the Eidolon, is that he argued that there are different types of time. And his argument was very clever. He said, how do we know that time flows? And the only way we know how time flows is because it flows against something else. Like, for instance, when you look at a river flowing, the only way you know the river is flowing because you see it flowing relative to the riverbank. If you took the riverbank away, you couldn't tell it was flowing. And the same is with time, because if we're flowing with time and there's nothing to measure time against, what is time moving against? And he argued, so there must be another form of time, which he called time two. And he said, so it's time two that allows us to balance the movement of time one. Okay which is quite clever. And then he said, but then imagine that there is a conscious, a, a version of you 
you are the observer one, which is an observer one in normal time. But then there is a version of you, observer two, which exists in the other time that this time is measured against. Now, if you're on the board, you'll probably realize observer one is the Edelon, observer two is the daemon. So what is taking place here? I argue that, and I'm taking here the some of interesting ideas by people like Minkowski, who was Einstein's tutor, and Minkowski came up with a concept called block time, and that time is, is, is solid. Time is not what we think it is at all. In fact, you can cut time into slices. And there is a time that runs at a right angle to the flow of time. And it's known as orthogonal time. And again, Philip K. Dick, the science fiction writer who I wrote a biography of a few years ago, was quite fascinated by the concept of orthogonal time, which is a time that exists outside of our time but flows in exactly the same way. Now, recent research has come up with some fascinating ideas. And one of them is a guy called John Kramer. And John Kramer has what he calls the transactional argument of quantum mechanics. And he argues now this, and I've made, I've come up from this and made even a bigger assumption from this. There are two forms of, of, of waves. There are advanced waves and retarded waves. And the waves of light, light and everything else. And advanced waves, and I never quite remember which way it is, but one is going forwards in time. And one is going backwards in time. Outside of our time frame, in another time frame. And when he mentioned this, I thought this is interesting because he was saying he explains then how messages can come from the future to the past. And I suddenly thought to myself, and again, I don't know if I'm the only person that's thought this. If I'm not, I apologise. OK, I'm not claiming something, but this is what I thought. If you take, if Kramer is correct, and he's one of the world's top quantum physicists, could it be that the present moment, the now, that infinitesimal bit that is now, that is the, the point between the past, which is already gone and doesn't exist, and the future, which also doesn't exist. So remember, we are at a nexus point between two things that don't exist. And the only thing that really exists is the moment now, which is now gone, has become another moment. And that in itself is incredibly mysterious. But could it be that the present moment is in fact an interference pattern of two wave functions that are coming together and creating an interference pattern. And they come together. Word is if if objects, if subatomic particles or waves or particles, whichever they are supposed to be, and of course there's a great mystery about that, wave particle duality, if they are waving from the future to the past and the past to the future and causing interference patterns, interference patterns are holograms. So is this how the holographic nature of reality works? Is the present moment is literally an interference pattern which creates the hologram, the three-dimensional hologram that we think we exist within? I mean, I really need to do the science more on this, but by God, this works. <laughs> so in which case, this is how we're moving through time.